In this webinar, I'm going to be talking about the vestibular system and cognitive function. Movement is essential for um, survival uh, of animals in an environment, but we need sensory information to know that we're moving, and we also need sensory information that can be uh, unambiguous, so we need a way of telling the difference between when the environment or something in the environment is moving and when we're moving, um, since otherwise we can get our own motion through the environment confused with the motion of objects in the environment. One of the most important sources of information about self-motion is the vestibular system, located in the inner ear, which responds to angular and linear acceleration in three dimensions. And it's so sensitive that in fact even the amount of head movement caused by the pulse beat is enough to stimulate it, which means it's being stimulated by all kinds of inadvertent accidental uh, head movements as we walk down the street, for example. And in addition, and very importantly, it's always stimulated by gravity, by gravitational acceleration, as long as we're on Earth. The vestibular system, in fact, evolved more than 500 million years ago in animals like jellyfish, where a primitive kind of um, statolith uh, stimulates sensory fibres to indicate to a jellyfish which way is up. And so the vestibular system is, is a, a, an ancient system, sensory system in evolutionary uh, terms. And for example, in dinosaurs, the orientation of the vestibular system in the semicircular canals and otoliths uh, in the dinosaur temporal bone um, has been used to make inferences about how dinosaurs um, held their heads and how they um, move through the environment. This is a, a diagram showing um, the entire auditory and vestibular system and um, here you can see the familiar um, auditory uh, ossicles and the cochlea. The vestibular system sits besides the auditory system and there are three semicircular canals, horizontal, anterior and posterior canals that encode angular acceleration in three dimensions. And then there are two otolithic systems which are related to the primitive statolith system that exists in jellyfish. And in, in humans, in mammalian species, these are the utricle and the saccule, which are a bit hard to see on this diagram. However, if we look at this one from Brodell, we can see that, that under the horizontal canal um, and besides it, there is the utricle and below that the saccule. And these are two of the oldest parts of the vestibular system, which, as I said, um, uh, have, a, have an analogue in, in, even in invertebrates. And these are the otolithic um, parts of the labyrinth that respond to gravitational acceleration as well as other kinds of linear acceleration. <clears throat> this is a, um, a 3D recreation that we did following micro CT scanning in the rat and the human, showing at a different orientation the three semicircular canals um, as well as the utricle and saccule in relation to the cochlea. So, the three semicircular canals encode angular acceleration in all planes, and the two otoliths, utricle and saccule, encode linear acceleration. Now, probably the most important function, or the most basic function, of the vestibular system in humans, um, in, in, in bipedal um, uh, animals, is, the, is the, the vestibular ocular reflexes, which can be vertical or horizontal. I'm showing a, uh, a horizontal vestibular ocular reflex here and in this schematic diagram we can see the horizontal canal on the left side and the right side and basically when the head is moved to the left the vestibular ocular reflex generates an eye movement equal and opposite to the right side and this happens through transmission of information about horizontal acceleration to the brainstem vestibular nuclei via the vestibular nerve and their projections the projections of vestibular nucleus neurons to um, the, uh, the abducens nucleus and the ocular motor nucleus. Um, over on the left hand side here we've got a, a VOR trace using search coils showing the eye in black and the head in 
in grey. And what you can see over time here in terms of velocity is that as the head moves in one direction, the eyes move in the other direction, equal and opposite. And so the addition of those two, the sum of those two lines should be a straight line because the eye movement should exactly cancel out the head movement. Now, obviously we make voluntary uh, eye movement um, and we may want to look in the direction that our head is moving. And in that case, the cerebellum cancels the VOR, but the VOR is operational when we don't intend our head to move. And also, um, this eye movement, the VOR, occurs very, very quickly with a latency of probably maximally 15 milliseconds. So it's designed to compensate for all those unintentional movements your head makes when you're walking around or running um, or when you miss your footing, stepping off a curb. On the, the right-hand side here, you can see a Snellen chart, and this is a depiction of what the world looks like if someone doesn't have a vestibular ocular reflex that's operating properly. So here's the normal condition here. And over on the right-hand side here, the world will look blurred to someone who has no VOR. And this is a condition called oscillopsia. And people without a functional vestibular system experience oscillopsia. So when they walk around, the world appears to bounce around as they walk. Well, the idea that the vestibular system might contribute to cognitive function, like memory, uh, goes back actually to the 1960s, although the evidence wasn't very direct. There was an idea that because the vestibular system encodes the movement of uh, the head through space um, and encodes acceleration and calculates velocity and position of the head um, in three dimensions, that this kind of information, like a, a GPS, um, must be communicated to areas of the brain that want to calculate where you are in the environment, even in the absence of other sensory information like visual information, or perhaps where, when that visual information is degraded in darkness. And there were various studies done throughout the 80s and 90s, uh, but then in the late 1990s, more specific sorts of studies, well-controlled studies, were done. And here's an example of, of one, one that we were involved in um, in the 2000s. And in this study, uh, which was done with Thomas Brandt and Michael Strupp in Germany, we took patients with bilateral vestibular loss and looked at them eight to ten years after the bilateral vestibular loss uh, in a, a basic memory task. And it's important to note because, you know, people often ask, well, you know, if people have a otological dysfunction, um, is the effect of the, of the vestibular loss confounded with hearing loss? Is it just hearing loss that's causing the, the, the problem? In this study, only one of these patients had total post-operative hearing loss. And what we tested them in, and we, we compared them to 10 sex and age match controls, was a task called the, 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 the virtual Morris water maze, which is equivalent to, or analogous to, the, the one used in rats. So this is a task where um, if you put a rat in a uh, Morris water maze, um, which is filled with um, opaque fluid, um, a, a platform appears and, and the rat has to navigate to that platform in a particular quadrant and then the platform is submerged and the rat has to remember where to go. In this case, the patients were sitting at a computer a, a, in front of a huge computer screen and we had the same kind of protocol. First, a platformer or a target appeared in a particular quadrant and then they had to remember where that platform had been or that target had been in, in following trials. And what we found was that the patients with bilateral vestibular loss performed consistently worse than the controls in this task. For example, they spent less time in the, in the correct quadrant of the virtual Morris water maze. And you can see that females perform worse than males. And also, if you looked at their heading error or the degree to which their trajectory was incorrect from the correct path, the people with bilateral vestibular loss um, showed greater error. Now, in this same study, we actually did um, um, MRI on their uh, brains, and we found that these people with bilateral vestibular loss had about a 17% decrease in the volume of the bilateral hippocampi. And it, it, this was done in a way that, that uh, controlled for differences in, in brain volume and so forth. 
um, and it was just the hippocampus that was atrophied. And this was the first evidence that the hippocampus atrophies in people with um, bilateral vestibular loss. Now, since this time, many studies have been done, particularly in relation to ageing, and Yuri Agrawal and, and colleagues um, in Baltimore have done a number of studies where they've looked at the relationship between cognitive decline and ageing and the vestibular contribution to it. And these are very statistical studies, but in this particular study, based on over 1,300 patients, the Romberg test was used to uh, identify vestibular dysfunction. And it was found that um, vestibular dysfunction mediated about 14% of the association between ageing and performance on a particular cognitive task called the digit symbol substitution score. And they controlled here for visual function and also hearing, and they found that the vestibular contribution to this cognitive decline on this particular test was greater than the contribution of hearing loss or visual loss. Another uh, category of, of evidence uh, along the lines of vestibular dysfunction contributing to memory loss, particularly spatial memory loss, uh, are the animal studies. And there are a lot of these now, 20 to 30 different animal studies. This is one that we did. This, this was done in animals, in rats, that were 14 months following bilateral vestibular loss. So this is quite a long time point after the, the lesions. And they were tested in darkness on a foraging task, which looks like this, where the animal, a rat will make a, a home in one of these um, apertures, and it'll have a little cage below. And it will go out in light or darkness and forage for food. And when it finds it, it, its natural tendency is to bring it back home. But it's got to remember where the correct home is. And so in this task, what we do is, after training them in light, we put them in darkness, and we use a, an infrared digital tracking system to look at their ability to go and find food and bring it home. And then in between different trials, we actually rotate, rotate the table. So they've got to find, they've got to keep remembering new positions. Um, and essentially what happens, if you look at the number of errors they make or the velocity um, they use to get to the food and bring it back, whatever measure you, you use, but I'm showing error here, um, we find that animals with bilateral vestibular loss always show more errors than sham animals. So in these diagrams, I should say it's a bit more complicated because we're also trying to see if we can make the memory loss worse by giving them a synthetic cannabinoid. But it doesn't actually make any difference because the bilateral vestibular deafferentation animals, BBD animals, are shown here and here, and these are the sham animals. And what we hear, have here on the y-axis is the area under the curve for the number of errors over time. And you can see that the BBD animals make consistently more errors. If we look at this in terms of a circular statistical analysis plot, a rose plot, these are the sham animals up here where on this diagram zero represents the correct uh, direction or the correct location of, the, of their home cage. Uh, and you can see that all the sham animals are clustered around zero. So there's a bit of a vari variability in their ability to, to, uh, to find the right direction, but generally they're pretty much on target. Whereas the animals with no vestibular systems, they're distributed randomly around 360 degrees. That, that is, they have no idea where they're going. Now, one might think perhaps this is due to hearing loss. Uh, well, in these experiments we try to control for this by removing the tympatic membranes in the sham animals. Now I realize this is not a complete uh, auditory control but it's a partial one and these animals with the tympanic membranes removed perform pretty much like normal animals compared to the vestibular lesioned animals. The other thing is it's possible that it could be an effect on locomotor activity um, but in fact we found no statistical relationship between locomotor activity and the number of errors. Um, that is, you could not predict the number of errors from the locomotor activity of the animals. However, that might have been changed by the, the bilateral vestibular lesions. This literature is a growing literature, and this is probably the most recent study from uh, David Wilkinson and, and colleagues in, um, in, in the UK, uh, where they try to 
find out whether the memory impairment that they observed in vestibular patients was independent of psychiatric impairment like anxiety disorders and depression, fatigue and also sleep uh, problems. And in this study they reported that indeed these memory impairments were independent. So what is the neural basis of this is one of our uh, keen interests and we have focused on the hippocampus realizing that the hippocampus is not the only important place in the brain for um, encoding and, st and storing memories but it's an area that we started with back in the early 2000s mainly because it's known to be important for spatial memory memory for places in the environment also it contains spatially selective neurons called place cells um, which increase their discharge or their firing rate for particular locations in the environment. Um, and um, these cells are related to other kinds of spatially responsive cells like head direction cells in the thalamus and also grid cells in the entorhinal cortex. And you might know that several years ago uh, John O'Keefe won the Nobel Prize in medicine for the discovery of place cells in the hippocampus and um, um, Edvar and Britt Mayer Moser won the Nobel Prize for their discovery of grid cells in the entorhinal cortex. It's been shown now that all of these kinds of neurons become dysfunctional in animals that have peripheral vestibular lesions. So clearly the vestibular sensory input is necessary for this global positioning system that exists in the, in the medial temporal lobe. Now, how does vestibular information get to the hippocampus? Well, it's very complicated and it's not totally understood. Um, I'm not going to go through all of these pathways, but at the moment we think there are about, um, about three, uh, three, four, maybe five of them. Um, most of them originate in the vestibular nucleus in the brainstem. Um, there's one that involves the what they call the theta pathway from the pedunculotegmental uh, pedunculopontine tegmental nucleus um, up through the supramammillary nucleus to the septum into the hippocampus. Uh, there's another one that goes through the head direction pathway through the anterior dorsal nucleus of the thalamus into the entorhinal cortex. There's a, a major pathway that's been known for a long time via uh, many parts of the thalamus and into the parietal cortex and there's probably an, uh, an additional one, a fourth one, that goes through the cerebellum. And, in, and indeed, um, you know, many people will know that, that, um, that the vestibular nerve projects not just into the brainstem vestibular nucleus, but also directly into the cerebellum. So there are two, there are two ways that um, that information can come um, uh, through the cerebellum, from the vestibular nucleus and also directly from the vestibular nerve. And at the moment, we don't know we don't know which are the most important pathways, um, and we don't know whether different kinds of vestibular input, for example, from the canals versus the otoliths, is weighted more in some pathways than others. And that's what we're trying to find out at the moment. So some of the studies we've done have involved um, selectively electrically stimulating in anaesthetized animals, uh, rats different parts of the of the vestibular labyrinth that is selectively stimulating the um, the ampullae of the horizontal canal anterior canal posterior canal utricle uh, the otolithic um, maculae of the utricle and saccule and comparing it with stimulation of the cochlea in order to find out the extent to which different parts of the vestibular labyrinth and the cochlea are represented um, in the hippocampus and so this is a typical sort of potential we get. It's a triphasic potential with phase one, phase two, phase three. Um, and this particular example is from electrically stimulating the posterior canal. These are all fairly long latency pathways of around at least 21 milliseconds, going up to about 45 milliseconds. So, um, I mean, that, that's a result of that vestibular input going through the um, vestibular nucleus and then through these complicated um, multi-stage pathways. And here's just a, a, a quick overview of, of these sorts of results. Um, here we're looking at the horizontal canal, anterior canal, posterior canal, utricle, saccule and cochlea all stimulated at the same 
uh, amplitude of 300 microamps and the same frequency of 400 hertz. And I should say great care was taken to um, ensure the selectivity of the stimulation by using fine bipolar electrodes um, so that there was minimal current spread by moving the electrodes away from the, the target uh, receptors and putting it back again to make sure that the, the, the stimulation was isolated. And in these colourful plots here, these 3D plots, we're looking at the amplitude of the triphasic potential I just showed you with the first, second and third phases along the z-axis. And here we've used to record the potentials um, a multi-electrode array uh, with 16 electrodes implanted in the hippocampus bilaterally, so eight on each side. Um, and so what we're looking at here uh, for each of these particular parts of the inner ear uh, are the amplitudes of the field potentials across all of these electrodes and the electrode assembly is such that it covers most of the hippocampus and we can see that for example if we look at the if we look at the utricle and we look at the the saccule um, we can see a distinctly asymmetric response um, where responses to the second set of eight electrodes are bit bigger than the first set of eight electrodes on the other side of the brain. Whereas if we look at, for example, the horizontal canal, um, the responses are more, more symmetrical. Um, the cochlea is distinctly asymmetrical. If you stimulate the cochlea, um, these last eight electrodes are on the contralateral side, and you can see the biggest response is in the contralateral hippocampus, which is what you'd expect. In any case, these studies are helping us to grasp um, how different kinds of vestibular information is projected into the hippocampus, where in the hippocampus, um, and what we're finding is that, that stimulating all the different parts of the labyrinth will activate the hippocampus, but in a, in a different way, in a different pattern, and that stimulating the co cochlea will also uh, activate the hippocampus, but in a way that's different to the vestibular structures. But this provides firm evidence that the hippocampus does receive um, vestibular information um, via the vestibular nucleus in the cerebellum. Well, one of the things that we wanted to look at, and we did this back in, uh, in, in the early 2000s, is, is the effect of bilateral vestibular loss on these place cells that were discovered by John O'Keefe in the hippocampus. Um, these place cells are cells that increase their firing for particular parts of the environment that, for example, a rat has already explored. And they're thought to be an important part of the way that the brain encodes place and space. And since place and space is going to be sensed by changes in vestibular stimulation, it makes sense that vestibular information will be used by the hippocampus, along with other kinds of sensory information like visual input, and also um, um, uh, somatosensory input and proprioceptive input. If you look down here on the left-hand side, here's an example of, of what place cells normally look like, um, where these clusters of, of uh, blue and red um, show areas where a place cell, an individual place cell, um, uh, has increased its firing rate. So you can see for this particular place cell, if this is a cylindrical environment like this, then this particular cell fires in that area, whereas another cell will fire somewhere else and another cell will prefer another uh, position. So different place cells have different preferred firing locations. And so in this experiment, what we did is we implanted rats under anesthesia with um, a movable electrode to record different place cells. And then when, when they recovered from the anesthesia, we recorded neuronal activity from single cells as the animals moved around in an environment uh, in light and darkness and we had a digital camera to, to track their, their movement. Over on uh, the left side here under A, here is one single place cell recorded over 37 days and you can see that this cell constantly fired in the same location uh, in this cylindrical environment in all cases and that its firing was very circumscribed. However, um, after bilateral vestibular deaffrontation, shown here in B, um, a similar place cell shows no spatial preference at all. The, the, what would have been called its place field 
has kind of disintegrated and fragmented and the cell fires all over the place. There's no information about position in the environment that can be gleaned from this kind of firing um, because the firing is indiscriminate. And this particular place cell was recorded over six weeks. So it never got any better. Um, and the other thing is when these same cells were recorded in light and dark and light, it didn't make any difference. If you put them in light, um, the place cells in the BVD animals show the same kind of indiscriminate firing as they do in dark, whereas the sham animal place cell will show the same discrete firing in both in light and dark. So this was some of the first evidence, along with evidence from uh, Jeff Torby at Dartmouth, that bilateral vestibular loss leads to dysfunction of hippocampal place cells.